the, the whole issue of guru, who's a qualified guru, who's an qualified guru. We were exploring the idea that, well, if, if in fact a qualified guru is such a rarity, um, then how is something like the Krishna Consciousness Movement supposed to go on? How are the teachings supposed to get spread? How is it supposed to, like, you know, infiltrate into society? Uh, perhaps you're taking too radical of an interpretation, too um, extreme or dogmatic a, uh, an approach to uh, the whole issue of guru, qualified guru and guru succession. Well, first of all, spreading, it's spreading, but what's spreading? It's spreading into society. But what's spreading? You know, pseudo Krishna consciousness spreading into society has no eternal value. So we need the real thing to be spreading. Now, the rarity of Guru. First of all, Shastra directly says, Samahatma Sudur Labaha. Sudur Labaha. Labaha means gain. Dur means, Dur Labaha means very difficult to gain. Sudur Labaha means extremely difficult to gain. Samahatma, that Mahatma, who is the Mahabharata, Sudur Labaha is very difficult. So Bhagavad Gita says that the Mahabharata is very, very rare. Agreed or no? That's true. That's what it says. All right. So that uh, Vava intoxicated, Prema intoxicated, Mahabhagavat on the highest level of Guru, very rare. But also what's rare is the disciple who deserves to contact him. This is what's being misunderstood here. The emphasis should not be on the Guru being rare. The emphasis should be on the disciple being rare. The person who actually deeply wants to have a genuine Guru is a rare commodity. The human form is very rare. So, and then very rare within the human form, or let's just say rare, very rare might be taken a little too far, but rare is that human who says, I need to, I need not only to escape, I really want to escape. That's true. I want liberation. Escape means liberation. Escaping the laws of material nature means liberation from those laws. So moksha, mukti. But even beyond that, vimukti, meaning to go to the spiritual sky for uh, rejuvenating the eternal relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the spiritual sky. Someone with that very great desire, very deep, profound desire, automatically will do, will act in ways that he, he or she, but we'll use the male gender just to make things simple. He will automatically be dictated by Paramatma, do this next, pass this test next, do this for me next. Now you do this. And he will follow those instructions and he will, therefore, through following those instructions from Paramatma, will be led to the Guru because the sincere disciple who's serious attracts the Guru to himself. The Guru exists, but uh, Gaurakishar Das Babaji, genuine Guru, but he was hard to find. He is hard to attract him to you. And he only accepted one disciple. So the issue here is really the number of disciples. If you get into the number game, numbers mean nothing in regard to the absolute truth. Spreading pseudo-Krishna consciousness, that's not ultra difficult to do. There's some difficulty in it, but it's not ultra difficult. But spreading real Krishna consciousness, that's very difficult because that requires the guru and a sincere disciple who gets genuine initiation because the guru is genuine. To get that guru, you need to be sincere, serious, have knowledge and luck. All those things are needed. You need to have some gravity, some seriousness. 
a frivolous person cannot contact a guru, or let's just say that if he does contact a guru, it's by great fortune, and in many cases he will not take advantage because he's frivolous. To be serious about it means that the guru is full of knowledge and heavy. Guru means heavy with knowledge. So a serious person, he's also got some gravity. So he naturally gravity attracts the most great. Sincere means what? We discussed that previously. Honesty. Sinceres. In the Roman times, there were coins, but also, unlike today, or today is less like that time, coins were not the main medium, and paper money was not the medium. There was an important medium of statues. Statues were very big in the Roman times. So if you had a high quality statue from a sculptor, then uh, you had a commodity that you could get valuables, either coins from it or wheat or houses or whatever. So, but what cheapened these statues was if there were uh, nicks that, that carved out small holes into the statue. So if there was that, then the statue lost significant value, just like a new car, once you pull it off the lot, it automatically goes down a significant amount because now it's a used car. But in those days, they didn't think like that. Uh, the age of the statue could actually add to its value, but if it had nicks in it, chips out of it, then, so if somebody was gonna sell the statue in order to become wealthy, you wanted to have a statue that didn't have any of these uh, nicks or chips. Those, this, the Latin for that was called ceres, C-E-R-E-S. If it, uh, any nick was called a ceres or chip out of it. Sin uh, was a prefix, means without. So you wanted sin ceres. You wanted a statue that did not have the ceres in it. So the word that we use sincere means straightforward, honest, you're without duplicity. What you're saying is what you're meaning. What you're wanting is what you're really wanting. You're not sophisticated. You're sin seres, you're sincere. Just like that statue that it, they say, all right, is your statue, I'm willing to buy it for X amount of lira, whatever they were using. Is it sin seres? Then I'll buy it for that. Otherwise, with Ceres, I might not buy it at all. It's got even one ship. So a disciple needs to be sincere, which means honest. Because that process of honesty is a Brahminical quality, as we talked about earlier. Shamahat Damahat Tapak Shaucham, Shanti Arjvamevacha, Gyana Vigyanam Astikyam, Brahma Karma Svabhavajam. Brahma Karma, the Brahmins, their work, their karma, that they're born with by their nature, by their essence, by their svabhava, ramakarma svabhava jam, by their state of being, that they're born with, is they're born with the honest quality. They're honest with themselves and they're honest with others. They're straightforward. This quality is very much required in order to become uh, successful. So you say, oh, we have an inflation of bogus gurus. Yeah, I agree. But the fact of the matter is that there's also an inflation of insincere seekers, insincere quote-unquote disciples, although that term has to be used lo loosely in this case because disciple means discipline. So it comes from that word discipline. So if there's really undisciplined person to call him a disciple. He may be an initiated adherent, that would be more apt a phraseology. So dogma means uh, wrong teaching said to be right teaching. Wrong process said to be right process. So dogma means uh, wrong teaching said to be right teaching. Wrong process said to be right process. For example, worship of the group, worship of the form of the group, worship of the corporate structure of the group.
climbing the lattice work of the bureaucracy in order to say that that shows that you're advanced because now you're on a higher level of bureaucracy. All these things are false processes. They're dogmatic and they produce false teachings, such as the false teaching that some kind of governing body commission automatically has a self-corrective mechanism intrinsic to it. When the guru never gave it that because a guru cannot give it that. Just like a guru cannot say Shiva is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, a guru can say that Shiva is the Supreme Personality of Servitor Godhead, His Lordship Shiva. Yes, very, very exalted, has his own sampradaya, but he's not Ishvara Parama Krishna. If a guru says that, he's not guru. You have to give the teaching as it is. That's called Siddhanta. That is called radical, going to the root. Here is the teaching as it is. Here is the process as it is. And the process and the teaching doesn't say that worship of the corporate structure of the occult uh, teachings within that are dogmatic, that these worshiping, these teachings, these sayings, these Prabhupada says, uh, this is not the absolute truth. This is... Uh, superfluous to the absolute truth. It's flotsam coming off the, the original boat. It's not the real thing. You know, the, the, uh, the Krishna conscious movement, since uh, Prabhupada disappeared in the last 30 plus years, um, there are a lot of people who joined it in the last 30 years. And a lot of these people like Krishna consciousness and they, they like the gurus and they like going to Rathiatras, the festivals, and they're very active. These people, uh, they would respond to what you're saying by, by saying, well, you sound very negative or you sound um, dogmatic or, or um, bitter almost. Um, uh, surely it's a good thing that since Prabhupada disappeared that, you know, uh, his books have continued to be distributed and that uh, the deity worship has gone on and classes are going on. Um, do you see any benefit from any of these things? Well, the Gaudiya Math can use the same argument, but Prabhupada didn't accept it back then. When Prabhupada formed the League of Devotees in Jansi in the 50s, Prabhupada didn't form a branch of the Gaudiya Math. So he didn't think that there was a great deal of value in what was going on with the Gaudiya Math, but they were making devotees, they were spreading throughout India still. And when he came to America, he was an initiate of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Goswami. Prabhupada came to America. He didn't call his society Gaudiya Math. So that argument could have been given back then that why are you doing this? We have disciples, we have devotees who are very dedicated to the Gurus and the Gaudiya Math. Why aren't you staying with the Gaudiya Math? Prabhupada saw something that was not right going on. And in his own books, you mentioned the books, the books you say are still spreading. You know, they're still being spread a little bit, but the books are being changed with hundreds and thousands of different changes that are unauthorized. So whether you're getting the actual teachings or whether you're getting dumbed down, watered down versions of what Prabhupada actually taught, that's a very major question. Hmm. And the honest answer to that question is that they are dumbed down. They are watered down. They've been changed. Which means now, in many ways, in many sentences in those books, it's unauthorized. It's just like, uh, we know of one real blatant example of this, although there's more than one that I could give, but I'll just give one. But in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, in the Adi Lila, right near the beginning, it talks about the Paran Para, and it talks about Narottam Das Thakur and Vishwanath and Chakravarti Thakur, <clears throat> and gurus of that time who never met, who never could have met on the physical plane because their lifespans while they were on the physical plane didn't overlap. But yet, Prabhupada said, one initiated the other. He used the term when he made his original writing that one initiated the other, even though they never met on the physical plane. But then this got changed later on after Prabhupada left. 
There's just one blatant example of an obvious motivation that has caused an obvious change, which means that a teaching, which was a siddhanta, got turned into a dogma by the change. I could give more, but the fact of the matter is that if, they, if the argument is made, the books are still being distributed, but are the books still the same? This is a major argument because uh, even Prabhupada talks about the Christian religion, that what's going on in the name of the Bible isn't the original teachings of Christ. The original Bible, that's the oldest of Bible uh, existing now, is 400 AD, and the only a fragment of it. So what were Christ's original teachings could be questioned, or are these the teachings of later writers? The point is that a watered-down, dumbed-down version of Krishna consciousness to say that it's greatly valuable is just flat-out wrong. It leads to complacency. It leads to a consciousness of, well, I'll go back to Godhead when you won't. Because to go back to Godhead is very difficult. Spiritual life is undoubtedly difficult. And to go back to Godhead is extremely difficult. Someone say radical, what's the most radical thing? The most radical thing is to give up all connection to material life, to material consciousness, to material existence, and to go back and reestablish uh, your relationship, your rasa, your sampanta, with the Supreme Personality of Godhead for eternity in the spiritual sky and to get out of the wheel of sansara and not just merely reach Brahman, which you won't be able to stay in anyway because there's no ananda there. No real Ananda. There's Brahma Ananda, but that's not real Ananda. The real Ananda is present when you go beyond the Brahma Jodi. So all these arguments on the uh, social plane, that socially we, we have so many devotees. If a devotee is claiming to have the Bhakti Lata Beach and to be initiated, is there any way materially to substantiate it? The answer is negative. You cannot have an affirmative answer to that because all conditioned souls can only establish as facts things within their yaksha uh, purview, a little bit of anima. But they don't have any transcendental vision. Their senses are limited. Their mind is limited. Their brain is limited. They can't, no conditioned soul can say, you received initiation. And including the person who's initiated, if there's contradictions showing that maybe you did not. It can't be proved in a court of law. It can't be proved as a fact on this plane. Therefore, what needs to be proved is that are the teachings, is the Siddhanta staying exactly the same? Is the process staying exactly the same? If the process is exactly the same, if everything is being done according to what was authorized by the previous Acharya. And we say Acharya here, we mean Sampradaya Acharya, not just a normal, regular uh, Matyamadakarya. We're talking about the Sampradaya Acharya. We're talking about the Mahabharata. So what Srila Prabhupada said was authorized. Is that continuing? Is his orders that he gave, his self-effulgent, self-evident orders, are they continuing? If they are, then, fine. Then, genuine guru must be present or should be present. If a guru is present and the orders are being followed, then he's guru. But if the guru that is pretending to be guru is not guru and he's giving initiation, then he's not giving the bhakti lot to beach. He's giving some kind of other initiation. For example, he may be giving the quote-unquote, with quotation marks on each side of it, iskan beach. Or he may be giving a beach in relation to what is his specialty. For example, he might have a specialty of love bomb, or he might have a specialty of making money. Whatever is his specialty, he might initiate that inspiration and beach into the follower. Initiate that inspiration and beach into the follower. Uh, or he might be a flat-out, full-blown sahajya. So he might initiate some kind of sahajya bij, like the uh, neo um, Jatagosani bij, or the neo Kartabaja bij, the Kartabaja sahajya sect, which the current Ritviks 
are without their knowledge following. That's the Hajjia sect of the 13. Uh, that Kartabhaja had the principle that once their, their guru left, then no more gurus after that. So every new person coming is initiated by a guru who no longer is physically manifest, but that was never Prabhupada's teachings. That's not the Vedic teachings. That's not the Vaishnava teachings. That's the Sahajya teaching. But in the current and postmodern context, it's a Neo Sahajya and it's Neo Kartabhaja. Uh, so you can have the Jata Gosani where the person says, I'm Guru. Remember, a Goswami, a genuine Goswami, what is a genuine Goswami? Vacha Vegam, Manasaha Kuroda Vegam, Jiva Vegam, Udara Pasta Vegam, Etan Vegam, Yovish Heta Thira. Sarvam Apiman, Priti Ving, Sashishya. Thiraha. Thiraha means undisturbed. Thiraha means Brahma realized. Brahma Bhuta, Prasanatma, Nasochati, Nakanshati, Samahat, Sarvesha Bhuteshu, Mud Bhaktim, Levate Param. That the Guru. He is Brahma Bhuta because Nasochati, he never laments about anything. Nakanchati, he never hankers for anything. And Samatvam, he sees everybody Panditaha Samadarshanaha. He's a Pandit. He's a very learned man because he sees everybody equal. And what does he attain? Oh, Madhvaktim Labhate Param. It doesn't say Labhyate, it doesn't use the future. It says Labhate, present. Madhvaktim Lavate Param. Param means best. Madhvakti, Paravakti. A Brahma Bhutta realized guru, he's on the plane of realizing his constitutional position. Shrotriyam Brahmanishtam. He's Brahmanisht. He's Nishta. He's firmly fixed in the absolute truth. Why? Because he's heard properly. Shrotriyam. So that kind of guru, he isn't Mahabhagavad yet but he's on a high platform. He's not going to change the teachings and he can be empowered to give the Bhakti Lata Beach because he has Mad Bhakti Lata Param. What to speak of the Mahabharata? Uh, there was some, an explanation, not from Prabhupada, from, uh, probably from the Gaudiya Mat side, when something like this, actually there's three types of gurus, um, one, both feet are in the spiritual sky. The other, one foot's in the spiritual sky, one foot's in the material world. And then the third kind, both feet are in the material world, but his vision is on the spiritual sky. I can explain that, but if I explain that, I give confidential knowledge. I'm willing to <laughs> do can, it. We can edit it out. Please. I'm willing to do it. But the fact is, is that if I explain it, I give very confidential knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because what's going on now is due to bewilderment. And if you're bewildered, you've got no business being guru. And if you have the audacity to be guru while you're still bewildered, then why should I unbewilder you? That can be explained. It can be explained very specifically. And I don't even want to give too many hints of how, if I give a hint, I might give it away. The point of the matter is that I'm willing to explain it. But what I'm saying now is that Guru cannot have an art. Do we agree on that? Yes. So, Guru cannot have an art. If there's any an art, there's not Guru. But what was Prabhupada's standard? Did Prabhupada say, GBC, you appoint Gurus. GBC, you veto Gurus. GBC, no three black balls have a vote. You can vote in Gurus. Did Prabhupada ever give this? No. Why did he never give it? Because he can't give it. He can't give it. Just like he can't say that Lord Shiva is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he can say that Lord Shiva is the Supreme Personality of Servitor Godhead. But he can't say that Lord Shiva is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Ishvara, Parama, Krishna. Lord Shiva is a great, great Ishvara, therefore he's called Maheshvara. Far, 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 far superior to the Jiva Tattva that are conditioned in the material world. Lord Shiva is a combination of the stupefying energy of the personality of Godhead, meaning the Tamaguna. He has a portion of the plenary power of Godhead within him. In other words, he is part God. 
and he has a little bit of Jiva Tattva in him also. It's very difficult to understand, but what isn't when it comes to the spiritual sky? The point is, is that the Guru cannot do certain things. He cannot say certain things. Certainly Lord Shiva is a Guru, otherwise how does he lead a Sampradaya? Similarly, as Divine Grace through the Prabhupada, Sampradaya Acharya, topmost Mahabhagava Guru, but there's certain things he can't do, and there's certain things he can't say, because he's not God. He can't change the absolute truth. He can deliver it, but he can't change it. So he is not going to say that, oh yes, in my organization, Guru is determined by votes of a commission. And I empower a commission of conditioned souls to have the intrinsic power and value of a self-corrective mechanism that's absolute. He cannot do this. He cannot say this. He cannot give it. He would not give it. Because conditioned soul means that if you give that, then there's no free will anymore. Yes. Well, yeah. Well, let me ask this question. Um, it, it's a big question. Let's see where it goes. What should have happened? In 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 we we know in November of 1977, Srila Prabhupada left this material world. Um, a lot has happened since then. A lot of controversy. A lot of intrigue. Um, looking back now, uh, what, what should have happened? given your understanding of Srila Prabhupada's teachings? Well, the answer is twofold because the train runs on two tracks here. First of all, what should have happened is Prabhupada should have never left. That's what should have happened. Prabhupada leaving means something wrong. And now I go into great detail on that. It's going to be difficult for the audience. So we're going to leave it at that. Prabhupada's movement had to be in the hands of honest men for it to succeed. Honest, we've discussed something already about honesty, sincerity, sincere, sincere, honest. If you're sincere, you know where you're at. Now, we're meant to improve from where we're at. That's the whole thing. Constant tests. Human life means constant tests. You constantly pass the tests. When you constantly pass the tests, where you were at yesterday changes. You go higher. You become more advanced. That's the whole meaning. That's the whole meaning of human life. That's the whole meaning of progressive human life. That's the proper application of the adjective progressive. The progressive materialism invariably gravitates towards permissiveness. Progressive spiritual life means to advance yourself in spiritual knowledge, spiritual power, svabhava improves to the sattva guna, and then goes towards shuddha sattva until it reaches shuddha sattva. So honest men were required to be the leaders. If the leaders were not honest, there's no possibility of a good result. So honest means you know where you're at. So therefore, why did Prabhupada say on May 28, 1977, regular guru, that's all? Why did he say that? Why in April, just one month previous in Bombay, when one of his secretaries said to him, none of us are self-realized, and Prabhupada said, yes. We cannot be guru, the secretary said, very clearly. We cannot be guru because we're not self-realized. Prabhupada said, yes. And then Prabhupada said in May of 77, regular guru, that's all. But by my order, become guru. Just say what I say. Say what I've given you, repeat. Spread the Krishna Upadesh as it is. You can expand upon it. You can deliver upon it according to your realization and expand the knowledge, but you can't change it by embellishing it in an unauthorized way. So these key statements, regular guru, that's all. Regular is an adjective meaning under regulation. A Mahabhagava is not a regular guru. 
a, a person who has reached a stage of spontaneity called Raga Anuga, he is not a regular person because he's no longer under spontaneous. Regulation has been transcended. But Prabhupada said, regular guru, that's all. But by my order. So two things were very clearly, actually, it wasn't so subtle, very clearly communicated. One, all you're qualified for is being a regular guru. Two, but you're not qualified yet. It's going to have to be when I order it. But that's all you're going to be qualified when I order it. Regular guru, that's all, but by my order. Now, everybody must admit that he did not give the order while he was physically manifest. If that order had been given uh, and had been taped and had been written and transcribed and signed by him, we would all know about it, I can guarantee you. I can guarantee you as much as the sun rising in the east and setting in the west. Every disciple would know about that document. Every disciple would know about that tape. Every disciple would have by now heard that tape. Prophet never gave the order. Now, the fanatics on the other end of the teeter-totter, they take that and say, Prophet never gave that order, so therefore nobody can be guru. That's wrong. What a nonsense that is. What faithlessness that is. We have the highest occult process. Bhakti, all yoga processes are based on mysticism. They're all based on the occult. Occult means hidden. When something is occult, it means it's hidden to, to contemporary, ordinary vision. It's an occult truth. And to reach it, you have to have some occult knowledge. You have to have some occult wisdom. You have to have some occult vision. You have to have some sensitivity to how things are actually working, what the meanings of things, symbol, symbolic understandings, for example. There's more than, it, but, than that, but that's just one division of occult knowledge. So, for a practitioner of any yoga system, what to speak of the highest, buddhi yoga, yoga of the intelligence, and not to be able to have contact, some kind of contact with your spiritual master even after he departs physical embodiment. Of course, his body was not a material body in, in the sense that we know material bodies, but still, he had a physical form that could be seen that could be touched, that no longer is present with us. He's no longer functioning in that form. But to say that then the disciple can't have any contact with him? Nonsense. Then that's faithlessness. That's materialism. That's not spiritual life. So anybody can receive the order if they receive the order. It's as simple as that. If somebody is a Brahmin, Brahmin means, qualified Brahmin, of course, really means to be Brahma realized. But anyone who's a Brahmin who has the qualities of the Sattva Guna and yet hasn't quite reached yet the stage of being Brahma realized, anyone on that plane, he's an honest man. Brahma karma svabhavajam. Arjabam is one of the key qualities of being a Brahmin. So any honest person will say, I've received the order, he says, and he's received the order, he can be guru. But regular guru, that's all. Means under regulation. Now, one may then take that and say, well, then, can anybody ever become a Mahabharata again? Sure. No problem. If you go into the gym and you say to the guy who's running the gym, what's your fees here? I'm, a, I'm the, one of the best weightlifters in the world. I'm right on the level of what Arnold Schwarzenegger was. What's your, what's your fees? You're on that level? Yeah. I can bench press two times my weight. Oh, man, you show me. You go, to that, you go to that bench right now, I'll put 210. Get on a scale, okay, you weigh 250. I'm gonna, put the, I'm gonna put the two times on. You bench press it, you got free here. I want you around. So if you're a Maha Bhagavat, you don't have to use any legalistic arguments. You already have all the mystic cities. You already have full knowledge. If you're a Mahabhagava, you can prove you're a Mahabhagava quite easily. And when you prove it, then what is the problem there? Everybody who's sincere and serious and has knowledge and is lucky is going to come to you. You're going to have plenty of protection. Even without human beings, you'd have plenty of protection. 
So the fact is that a Mahabhagavat is self-effulgent. He will manifest according to his powers. He will manifest according to his great knowledge. And most importantly, since our system is Bhakti Yoga, he will manifest according to his ocean of love. He will have an ocean of love, which we're all getting a little drop of now and then. And with that ocean of love, uh, he will have no problem being able to uh, show that he's Mahabharata. He won't want to be worshipped. He won't need to be worshipped. His followers will insist upon worshipping him for their own benefit and advancement, which he'll then acquiesce to. Why not? Sakshat Hari Tvain Astamasta Shastri. He, everything he's saying is directly Paramatma, directly Krishna. So therefore he's Shakshad Hari. He's not different from Hari on that basis. He's still Jiva Tattva, but he's a Sampradaya Chari. He's a Mahavagra. He's a Mahajan. Prabhupada makes it very clear that any Sampradaya Chari is a Mahajan also. So the, the process is not too difficult to understand. Regular guru, that's all. And if for some reason you get benedicted by the Supreme Personality of God and by your previous guru and you get the transcendental TV allowed to your mind and now you're in the spiritual world and now you have the full siddhis, you have the full mystic powers and you're now a Mahabhagavat and you have full knowledge, if you get that benediction, then that will be self-evident because you'll be self-effulgent to anybody. And the envious, of course, will attack you, but so what? You'll be able to deal with that. The process is very simple. The process is now complicated because of why? Because of evil. Because what produces evil? Evil is produced when you act either above or below your eligibility. Everybody has an adhikari. Adhikar. Adhikar means eligibility. Everybody where they're at. So if you're at some place, then according to that eligibility, you act according to it, that's not evil. That's why the animals are never engaged in evil activity, because they're always acting according to their adhikari. But a human can do evil, because he can act either above or below what he's eligible for. So when he acts above, he's an imitator, he's a pretender. It's a great evil. Why is it a great evil? This is not difficult to understand psychologically why, why it's a great evil. Because if somebody acts above their realization and pretends to be a, a, a guru when they're not, or pretends to be a Mahabhagavat when they're not, what happens? They slip up and it becomes known. They do criminal activities of some sort. They do dreadful activities of some sort. They do unauthorized activities of some sort. They make some colossal mistake. They uh, fall victim to some huge illusion. They engage in libertine activities, whatever it may be. They do something grievous. And then what happens to everybody? They think evil is supreme. They think there's no hope. There's no guru. We see anybody who tries to do anything gets nailed. Everybody's a pretender. Everybody's just trying to deceive one another. Everybody's trying to get over. It's just a colossal hoax. It's all a turtle tank. Everybody's trying to get on top of the other's shell and then pivot up and get up to the top of the, the aquarium on the basis of pushing the others down. Uh, it's, all, it's all evil. Evil is supreme enters into the consciousness when this pretension goes on. That's why if you act above your adhikar and pretend to be a guru when you're not, on any of the levels, be it with the two feet in, one foot in, one foot out, or both feet out, whatever the three levels. If, you, if you're not there, then it's evil because you're acting above your... And if, you, if your adhikari is that you should be doing certain things and you're not doing them, and you're doing things much lower than what you really have the power and the knowledge to do, and you're not stepping up to the plate and doing it, you're going to produce evil on the other end. Because people are saying, you know, I know he's got more than that. I know that he's higher than that. I know he's better than that. But he can't even act according to what I know where he's at. He must not believe. Well, therefore, I don't believe either. And it is that disbelief which produces the evil. Ashradatana purusha. Parantapa. 
a prapya man, nivartante, mrityu sansara vartmani. Mrityu, death. Lord Shiva is not the god of death. Lord Shiva is the god of destruction. Yamaraj is just the god of death, but there's a personality known as Mrityu also. Mrityu is a dreadful personality to have to deal with. Devotees don't have to deal with Mrityu because they don't die in that way. Because that's what's called transcending death, means you're not obligated to have to meet Mrityu. Whereas the conditioned souls must meet meet Mrityu. Ashradatana Purusha. If there's no faith, a person who's faithless, he might be a so-called good person, a so-called ethical person, a so-called moral person, etc. Of course, in the clutch, there's going to be no ethics and no, no morality for certain. But on a superficial, when things are going good, apparently a good guy, ethical, nice guy, all that stuff. Moral, but really not. Dharmasyasya, he doesn't follow Dharma. Ashradhana Purusha, Dharmasyasya, a prop yaman, Nivartante, he's not going to attain Mrityu Sansara Bartmani, he's going to attain Mrityu, death, and Sansara Bartmani, he's going to return to that path of Sansara. He's going to be on that path of Sansara, repeated birth and death. So act in above or act in below adhikar. You have to, we have to keep improving our adhikar. Little by little, it's a gradual process, Bhakti Vinod Thakur says. Nice gradual cleansing of the heart process. You get your opportunities. When opportunity knocks, be there. You keep going up. So does that answer that question? Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> another, another question along the same line. Um, at the time Srila Prabhupada left the world, the Krishna Conscious Movement was quite a large organization. Thousands of uh, um, initiated disciples of Srila Prabhupada, and there, there was uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, new devotees in the pipeline. Um, so the question, so, so I'll come back to that question, what should have happened? Of course, there weren't the qualified leaders. Uh, there was a lot of misunderstanding. Um, I don't know if this is a fruitful discussion or not. You know, in an ideal world. Well, first of all, we're supposed to have that ideal world, you see. In other words, Krishna consciousness movement is supposed to have ideal men that therefore create an ideal world. They don't create a utopian world. A utopian world is in the spiritual sky. Not here. You can't have utopia here because Maya uh, will make sure that you, there's no utopia. Never. Uh, the more you try to get utopia here, the more Maya is going to create tragedy. So utopia we don't see, but ideal we see. Ideal, ideal man of ideal character. Okay, so let's see where we can go with this. In that ideal world, with ideal men of ideal character, what kind of scenario could you envision happening? Very easy to answer this. And that is, to be all honest men means to be ideal men. If everybody was honest, then the Governing Body Commission would say to everybody, if you're Guru, if you've received the order, you then go out and you do it. If we see you're teaching wrong, we're going to shut you down. If we see you're giving a wrong process, we're going to shut you down. If we see you're a Sahaja, we're going to shut you down. We're going to come on you like a ton of bricks. But as long as whatever you're doing is verified by Guru Sadhu Shastra, by Prabhupada's direct orders, and we see that nobody is a Sahaji in your group, that you're preaching against it, nobody's a Mayavad in your group, you're preaching against it, we see that you are not uh, taking advantage of your power in order to seduce female disciples, we see that you're actually following the process and your disciples are following the process. We see all these things. Keep going. Very nice. And we'll encourage all temple presidents to recognize you, but we will not order them to recognize you. They're the temple presidents. It's their temple. If they don't want to recognize you, fine. Avoid those temples. There's plenty of temples. Make your own temples. But if a temple president wants to recognize you, fine. That's but we're not going to institutionalize Guru. 
We're never going to institutionalize guru. That's one track. But another track has to be present for you and that track to be considered. Namely is that no Mahabhagavad imitators allowed. Instead, they did the diametrically opposite thing. Their job was to stop just that very same thing that they therefore empowered, encouraged, and institutionalized. And every temple president had to accept it. And every devotee serving in those temples had to accept it, or indirectly, or in many cases directly, was driven out, and certainly couldn't speak against it. The world was carved into zones, how ridiculous that is. And the idea was Mahabhagava, even if not Mahabhagava, Makguru Si Jagaguru, as introduced by the blind uncle, who was not so blind, it turns out, because he knew exactly what he was doing. The fact of the matter is, is that the diametrically opposite path was taken from what would have been wanted. If what would have been taken would have been the honest approach, namely, Prabhupada and May said, regular guru, that's all. And Prabhupada never said anybody can be guru, never gave the order. So uh, if there are no gurus right now, we're not going to say because we need to have initiations, we need to have gurus when there are none. We're going to say, time for everybody to hammer down, get serious on your siddhanta, get serious on your sadhana, get serious about getting out of anartha. And if you get out of anartha, and if you're ordered by Prabhupada, to be guru, if you're not on the generic thing, not on that Chaitanya Charitamrita that says everybody become guru, well, that means Bhakta Tam can walk into the temple and two days later can say, I just saw this verse, Lord Chaitanya just ordered me. And he has very little knowledge. No. He's not been ordered. Not by that generic. If you've been specifically ordered, so if the situation was in late November, so first of all, even just using the past history that we know of, which went the wrong way, went diametrically opposite of the way it should have went. But if we just use that, Prabhupada left on November 14th and there weren't initiations until April. So you had this whole span where nobody was getting initiated. Did the world come to an end? Did devotees start chanting, stop chanting Jaffa due to that? You could have had a span of a year easy where nobody would say, oh, we've not initiated devotees. What is that? And using this uh, argument by the numbers coloring book, this is not the way to go. Numbers mean nothing. This has been proven in two ways. One way is the massive emphasis on numbers and money of books in the mid 70s through deceptive methods. So there was a huge output of books all around the world. But if everything had been kept at a pace, say where it was at, at 71, 70, 72, and everything had stayed at the same pace through book distribution in devotional paraphernalia, and maybe had just little tiny modest increases each year of say half a percent, or even a third of a percent. Where would we be at now in 2008? Instead, this huge emphasis on money and book distribution in the 70s through deceptive means has come to nothing in 2008. Even if it's 1% of what that was, I'd be amazed. But everybody knows it's no more than 5% of what it was. It's come to virtually nothing because the deception didn't prove to be the right way to go. Similarly, the whole emphasis on, we have to have initiations now, so we have to have numbers now, so we have to have gurus now, when we don't have gurus, then what has that produced now? That has produced faithlessness now. That has produced deviant groups now. That has produced an attrition rate of Prabhupada's disciples. That has produced deviant groups now. That has produced an attrition rate of Prabhupada's disciples, who were genuinely initiated, between the time of 1967, or 66 maybe, whatever the first initiation was, 66, 67, until 77, those disciples, while Prabhupada was physically manifest, at least 90% of those have left any of the organizational movement 
And out of those who have left, many have left completely, meaning that they are Shraddhatana Purusha. They're goners. And from my perspective, and I do not believe this deviates from the absolute truth, some of those who are in, joined other cults have in essence left. They may be spreading Krishna consciousness, quote unquote, in another way that has nothing to do with what our Sampradaya Acharya said was the authorized way to spread it, including Upasiddhanta, such as Upasiddhanta of the origination of the Jiva. So the point is, we have a very bad situation now, and it's bad because things were not done correctly. So I've given some, yes. uh, some analysis from a historical perspective of how it could have been done correctly, and it was all based on honesty. Sadhana-samastapakam-lokanam-hitakarinam-ibhumane-mannam-saranakaram-radha-krishna-padaram-innam-bhajananandinamatvalikam-bhajananandinamatvalikam-bhajananandinamatvalikam-bhajananandinam